The history of Freemasonry prompts many questions. Why were the Freemasons formed? Who invented the Freemasons? What's the purpose of Freemasonry? What's the true history of Freemasons? Join us as we look at the origins of Masonic history and historical Masons in this very brief history of Freemasonry explained by Freemasons. Hi, I'm Charlie and I'm a Freemason based in London and a representative of the Metropolitan Grand Lodge of London, which is essentially the organisation that looks after Freemasonry in London. And you can check us out by going to londonmasons.org.uk. So, what are the origins of Freemasonry? Well, let us take you on a very quick journey back in time through the history of Freemasonry. And we begin in the medieval era. There are several theories about the origins of Freemasonry and still to this day, the roots of modern Freemasonry are subject to intense speculation, particularly from non-Masons. But the general consensus among Masonic scholars, yes, we have scholars within Freemasonry who specialize in researching our own history, is that they lie with the guilds of medieval stonemasons that built our castles and cathedrals. Now, as was also the case with other medieval guilds, Early Freemasons were influenced by biblical narratives and incorporated many biblical builders in their foundation narratives and allegories. Famous builders and mathematicians from antiquity were also included, such as Pythagoras, and you can see a number of these adorning the ceiling of the Grand Temple in Freemasons Hall in London, the same building from which I'm speaking to you today. Many of the practices of these early guilds of stonemasons are still with us today, from the aprons we wear in our ceremonies to the handshakes which were originally a way for Masons to prove to others that they were qualified to receive their wages. There are no written sources from the early medieval era of a modern lodge, that is until we get to the 1660s and the writings of Elias Ashmole, the first recorded speculative Mason. What is a speculative Mason, I hear you say? Well, remember the Stonemasons Guilds? They are operative Masons. That is to say, they literally worked stone and built things. Speculative masons were those masons who had joined a lodge, but didn't work as stonemasons. Nowadays, of course, the vast majority of masons in modern Freemasonry are speculative masons. So Elias Ashmole wrote about his initiation in a lodge in Warrington in 1646, the first recorded evidence of the initiation of an English speculative mason notwithstanding the fact that those present and listed would have certainly been initiated themselves at an earlier date. From the 1660s, more evidence exists of gentlemen being made Freemasons. During what was one of the most divided periods in English history, directly following our civil war, Freemasonry provided a social environment free from the political and religious divisions that had devastated the country, and as such it flourished. Still, today, politics and religion are topics that are explicitly prohibited in our lodges, precisely because they are so divisive. Freemasonry also flourished during the rebuilding of London following the Great Fire of London in 1666. Many of the most prominent figures in that rebuilding became speculative masons, including Sir Christopher Wren, arguably the most famous, because he was lead architect of St Paul's Cathedral and who was in fact a member of what would become the Lodge of Antiquity. In fact, until very recently, they used one of the foundation stones from St. Paul's Cathedral during their ceremonies. So, what came next? Um, the foundation of the first Grand Lodge. So, on St. John's Day, 24th of June, 1717, four London lodges, uh, which had existed for some time, came together at the Goose and Gridiron Tavern in St Paul's Cathedral and declared themselves a Grand Lodge and elected Anthony Sayer as their first Grand Master. This was the first Grand Lodge in the world and so was the founding of the premier Grand Lodge, the first of its kind anywhere in the world and the origins of the United Grand Lodge of England. Its purpose essentially to represent Freemasonry and to regularise it across all of the lodges that had been springing up. Soon though, a rival Grand Lodge appeared in London with different practices. London, Scottish 
and Irish Freemasons had formed a rival Grand Lodge in 1751, labelling the original Grand Lodge Moderns and calling themselves Ancients. The two rivals existed side by side, both at home and abroad, for nearly 63 years, neither recognising each other as regular. English Freemasonry's home has been on Great Queen Street since 1775, and after nearly 63 years, the two Grand Lodges in England united on the 27th of December 1813 to form the United Grand Lodge of England. This union led to a great deal of standardisation of ritual, procedures and regalia. Operating under the core values of brotherly love, relief and truth, now expressed in the guiding principles of integrity, respect, friendship and charity, English Freemasonry attracted people from all walks of life and spread around the globe. In the times before a welfare state, it created charities to look after the well-being of members and their families. And over time, that has evolved uh, into a major support for charities of all kinds, beyond Freemasonry, through local communities and across the country. So, by 1814, some 647 lodges were in existence. The 19th century then saw a great expansion of Freemasonry, both at home and around the globe. By 1900, 2,800 lodges now existed around the globe under the jurisdiction of the United Grand Lodge of England. United Grand Lodge of England's headquarters, Freemasons Hall, where I'm speaking to you from today, originally called the Masonic Peace Memorial, was built between 1927 and 1933 as a memorial to more than 3,000 members of the United Grand Lodge who'd lost their lives in the First World War. In the three years after the First World War, more than 350 lodges were set up. And in the three years after the Second World War, nearly 600 new lodges came into being. In many cases, the founders were servicemen who wanted to continue the camaraderie and friendship that they'd built up during their war service and who were looking for a calm centre in a greatly changed and changing society. On the 14th of June 1967, the 250th anniversary of Grand Lodge was celebrated at the Royal Albert Hall. The centrepiece of the celebrations was the installation of His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent as our Grand Master. He still holds that office today and comes from a long line of Royal Grand Masters, which includes his father, George, King Edward VII, the Duke of Sussex and King George IV. On the 10th of June 1992, more than 12,500 Freemasons and guests gathered at Earl's Court in West London to celebrate the 275th anniversary of Grand Lodge. For the first time, press and television were present at a meeting of Grand Lodge and the event featured on television newscasts around the world. The tercentenary, or 300th birthday, of the United Grand Lodge of England was celebrated in 2017 in style throughout the year, culminating with a special meeting of Grand Lodge at the Royal Albert Hall, which was presided over by the Grand Master, His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, and attended by representatives of sovereign Grand Lodges from around the world. The North Gallery in the Museum of Freemasonry was opened as part of that celebration and tells the history of three centuries of English Freemasonry through displays and public tours. So that was a brief rundown of the history of Freemasonry and its origins. If you live in London and think you might want to become a Freemason, then you can click the link in the description below this video to join either Metropolitan Grand Lodge for men or the Order of Women Freemasons or the Honourable Fraternity of Ancient Freemasons, both for women. Links for all of them are in the descriptions. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. The links for both of those are also in the description. If you want to hear more about Freemasonry in London, then subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button, or comment below this video to tell us if there are any topics you want us to make content on in the future. But until then, thanks for watching.